In this video, I'll teach you five tips for underwater navigation so you can get to and from where you want to go. Let's get into it. It means bear right. Stop the There's no room here! When you're out scuba diving with a group, it's really easy to rely on a dive guide, the dive master, or just the group itself to get you to the cool dive spots that you want to go to, and more importantly, back to the boat or the shore that you started at. However, as a diver, we really should be able to rely on our own navigation skills in case we're ever separated from the group, separated from our buddy, or maybe we're just out with my buddy and I alone, and the other one doesn't exactly know how to get back to where we started, so we're going to rely on my skills to be able to navigate back to the entry point. Now, underwater GPS isn't a thing just yet, so here are five tips to help every diver with their underwater navigation. Plan your dive, dive your plan. Now, you've probably heard this before, but as a diver, it is imperative that we plan our dives out properly and then dive that plan. Before every dive, whether it's with a DM, with a group that you went on a charter with, or just you and your dive buddy, you should be planning out where you're going on the dive site, where you plan to navigate to, and then the important things like reminding what our turn pressure is or what time we're gonna be turning around, whichever one comes first. You can also talk about things like what the dive site looks like, maybe even draw it up. I know a lot of DMs do this on dive charters, for example, where they have a chart showing you what the dive site looks like. So you know what key features are there and you know things that you can find on the dive site itself, maybe where the ship is moored off to or you know where the boat's tied off to here and there or where the anchor is. And that way you can tell when you're navigating on the dive site itself, what natural references you have so you can end up back at that anchor point or back to the shore or back to the dock, wherever your entry point was, you can get back there after you've been diving. Remember, this could be something as simple as clues such as the shore runs north to south, so we'll be heading west into the water first. It's down a sloping reef and then, you know, we'll be heading back and backwards is going to be east. Again, the shore is north to south, so we'll be heading east towards the shore and that slope will come back up as we exit the water. Now this leads me to don't dive without your compass. Now, directions are great and knowing that the shore runs north to south, that's awesome, but it's a little bit useless if you don't have a compass and the ability to tell which direction you're actually facing and going. For me personally, I never dive without my compass. It's small, it's compact, I have it on a bolt snap just clipped off to a D-ring and it's easy to put into a pocket on my dry suit or my pocket on my wetsuit if need be and just kind of keep it stored away if it's something I'm not actively using. I personally use the Oceanic Clip Mount Dive Compass that I've put a bolt snap on so I can easily clip it off to a D-ring, whether it's in my pocket or on my shoulder straps. Uh, however, I also just bought the Sunto SK-8, which is a nice dive compass, um, a little bit nicer than this one actually, and it's also a bungee mount. So easy to mount on my hand, it's out of the way, it's always with me, and it's not gonna be you know, a big hassle or a big bulky item when I'm traveling or anything like that. Having a compass will allow you to pick out a heading and stay on that course, be able to do basic search patterns like squares or triangles and things like that, as well as be able to navigate to and from your entry and exit points, whether that's back to the mooring line or back to the shoreline if it was a shore entry. But that said, having a compass is only part of the equation. You need to know how to use the compass as well, and if you haven't seen it already, check out the card or the link down in the description below where I have a video about how to use a compass for underwater navigation or just how to use a compass for beginners. Now, all of that said, a compass isn't everything though, and we also want to make notes of natural landmarks and references that we can use during our dive to help us navigate. Natural navigation. Now, natural navigation is a bit of an art form in of itself, and depending on the dive site, it might be easier or harder to use this, and it just kind of depends on conditions and, you know, what you're looking at with the site that you're diving. For example, in the training quarry that I dive in regularly, pretty close to me here outside of the Raleigh, North Carolina area, we have both dock entries and beach entries that we can use, as well as a number of cool attractions we can see underwater. These are things like a shallow plane, a deep plane, uh, the yacht that Jimmy, Mr. Beast sunk. Go ahead and check out that video in the cards if you're interested in that. A lot of these objects also have lines or ropes that run between them. So when I'm navigating with a class, I actually don't really use a compass unless I'm going to someplace new or you know something that isn't marked just yet and what I can do instead is I can follow these lines between the platforms the plane the bus and things like that to kind of get to and from where I'm going this also means when I'm doing a fun dive that I can kind of head out in a general direction I know that I'll hit the shallow plane on the other side of the shallow plane from the dock I can keep swimming and there's gonna be a cliff face with a bunch of rock wall type stuff there I can pass that rock wall and kind of follow that cliff face all the way along to uh, what's known as the glass bottom boat and the yacht that again Jim 
Jimmy or Mr. Beast sank. Uh, that yacht then has a line that goes to what's known as a deep platform. And on the other side of that deep platform is the creepy playground, which spoiler alert, you get to see that in the video as well. So again, I expect you to check that out after this. These natural references are great for me because then as I start coming up towards the shallow end of the quarry, for example, I know that I'll hit the basketball hoop. And then if I turn a certain direction from there, then I can follow that line straight back to the edge of the dock. And wouldn't you know it, I'm right back to where I started, where I did my giant stride off the end of the dock. I can go ahead and take the stairs and exit the quarry and be right back out of the water. Now in the ocean, you'll have many of the same types of objects that you can look at as well. So now you might not have a plane or a ship or you know something like that that you can look at unless it's a, a wreck, for example. But instead, maybe you have pillar coral or a giant barrel sponge or you know maybe some sea fans that are faced a certain way and you know usually sea fans face kind of all in the same direction for example uh, you can also look at the sand at the bottom of the the floor and the sand will usually have ripples in it those ripples almost always run parallel to the shoreline so if you do a shore dive into the ocean those sand ripples are going to be running parallel with the shore almost every single time other things you can figure out in the ocean would be current or drift usually the current isn't going to change on you during your dive so if the current's going one direction you can kind of swim into the current first and then on your return you'll follow the current back to the boat or back to the shoreline or whatever it was that you left from usually things like this are are best for fixed objects like the you know corals and uh, sponges and things like that uh, but if there are like really territorial type of fish or animals they might be staying in one spot so you can use those but of course they, they might move so be careful of that and be mindful of that as well another thing to think about here is uh, specific groupings of rock formations so maybe there's a bunch of coral heads out there and you can do what's known as a clover pattern where you kind of go out and around the coral head back to the center point and then you go out and around the next one back to the center point out and around the next one back to the center point and you can see that you're kind of making like flower pattern or coral uh, clover pattern I should say around each of those coral heads that you just kind of circle around and back to the center point which would be you know the mooring pin or something like that now regardless of the environment that you're in there are a couple other things you can do that will apply both in freshwater and salt water and rivers and lakes and all of that type of stuff so one of those things is gonna be depths so think about you know if you got in the water off the boat and you were at a 30 foot depth at the bottom you probably want to move towards that 30 foot depth to get back towards the boat or you know in my rock quarry for example it gets shallow as you exit the quarry I know that for a fact when you go in the quarry you go in there's a shallow piece it drops down a little bit it comes up for a road that cuts through the quarry it drops back down again and then it continues to slowly get deeper and deeper so you know again knowing the contour or the slopes of the dive site that you're on is also going to be really helpful for you uh, if you have a wall on one side let's say you're swimming along the wall on your left shoulder to go back you're going to swim along the same wall on your right shoulder Shoulder, right and that'll send you back in the opposite direction and then finally things like light as well from the Sun so if it's a clear day it's not so overcast at all uh, the Sun is gonna be rising you know in the east and setting in the west so those are kind of fixed points so as long as it's not noon and you know you're far enough on either side of noon I guess that you can go ahead and see which direction the Sun's coming from those Sun rays coming into the light could be a good directional indicator for you too to get a rough bearing of you know which ways east which ways west and kind of help determine which direction you need to go from there. Now, before I get into that though, if you're finding this valuable already, feel free to hit that subscribe button and leave a comment for me. It lets me know what type of videos you'd like to see more of and which ones you enjoy too, so I can make more like that. Calculating distances. Now, as you navigate around, heading the right direction and finding these natural references to make note of is all great, but you still need to know about how far you've gone so you can make it back to that point again too. As recreational divers, we have a few ways that are pretty common to use in order to determine a rough estimate of how far we've gone distance wise. The first of these is measuring by time. So if we swam five minutes in one direction and then five minutes back another direction, in theory, we should end up about where we were. Now, of course, this is going to be dependent on how hard you were kicking. If there was a current or surge or drift that put you a little bit off to the side or, you know, you were swimming into a current and now you've got the current coming with you. But you can kind of equate this to driving down the road. If I say you should drive down that road for about five minutes or so, and then you'll see the Walmart on your right. Well, if you've been driving for 15 minutes and you still haven't found the Walmart, you might have made a wrong turn somewhere and maybe you got a little off course. And we can kind of take the same approach with scuba diving. Next, we can look at our air consumption. And I will say that this really only works if you stay at the same depth and the same kind of working rate. So, you know, you're not breathing harder as you come back or in one part of your dive. Um, so 
no currents or drifts or anything like that. But this is kind of a, a very rough estimate in a way that you can technically use to estimate how far you've gone in terms of how much air you've used out of your cylinders. Now, next we'll have what most recreational divers will know, especially if they've taken like an advanced open water or an underwater navigation course. Uh, again, this isn't a course. These are just tips for you for navigating underwater, but that's gonna be kick cycles. So a kick cycle is basically when you take your fin and you are flutter kicking, and your fin returns back to the starting point. Every time it returns back to the starting point, that's one kick. And we can use that to measure distance. So first of all, it's just number of kicks. So in your open water class, you might do a out and back, for example, where they tell you to do you know, 20 kicks out, turn around, do 20 kicks back. And that'll be like a straight line out and back navigation that you do. And that's definitely one way to do it. Um, in your advanced open water or underwater navigation, they should have you kick basically a known distance. So they'll use a line uh, that's like a, a known, you know, 100 feet or something like that, or about 30 meters, 33 meters would be about 100 feet, if I'm doing my math right. Uh, and, you know, basically they would have you count those kick cycles all the way out and then you should have your number. And then to be extra accurate, you can count those kick cycles all the way back. And it should be about the same. And you know, it might be 30 something, it might be 20 something. It just depends on how hard you're kicking and, and what you're doing. Um, the faults here is that it's mostly for flutter kicking. I think you could technically do frog kicks, but uh, you'd have to find a, a way to kind of count your frog kicks, I guess. Uh, it's not exactly a, a kick cycle in the same way that most people are taught. Um, and then of course, you know, if we are kicking harder or softer, if our fins change, if our gear changes with our streamlining, we're gonna move faster or slower through the water. If there's a current, if there's surge, if there's a drift, you know, all these different factors come into play. But when you are estimating, let's say that, uh, you know, I tell you, hey, the plane's over that way, it's at this degree heading, and it should be about 100 feet from where you are. Uh, you know, okay, 100 feet is roughly this many kicks for me. And if I pick, point that heading, I know what depth the plane's at, and I know it's about 100 feet or about 33 meters away, I can go ahead and kick, count those kicks. If I'm blindfolded even, I should end up basically right where I'm supposed to be. As long as I had the right directional heading, I swim in a straight line. And uh, you know, maybe instead of blindfolded, maybe I'm just looking straight down like this. I can look straight down at my compass, stay on that heading, stay at the right depth, do my kicks, and I should end up roughly where I am supposed to be at the you know shallow plane or whatever the object is you're looking for. Now, as you can see, all of these methods I mentioned do have their own inherent faults. And most of them have to do with things like current and drift or you know just changes in the way you're kicking right like natural differences in there but the point is is that when you combine a compass with natural references and then measuring distances or time you're really able to be fairly accurate so kind of you know all of those having their own inherent faults at least you have like oh okay hey I'm a little bit off to the side because I feel that current here so rather than compensating I'm gonna be looking out for that natural reference there's that pillar coral I'm supposed to be on the left of it let me correct and go back around there double check my compass I'm on the right heading all right keep going okay yeah I went about five minutes out it's been four minutes it should be coming up soon oh where's it at oh there it is now i can see the object and i'm back to my entry point so it's really the combination of all of these tips that are going to help you navigate underwater and then practice 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 one more thing i'll say about measuring distance underwater is scientific diving and technical diving and just more advanced diving in general they will use other things like tape measures underwater grid patterns uh, they'll actually have rulers and things like that depending on what they're measuring exactly uh, and they might even use line that has like like knots tied in it at known distances, like maybe every 10 feet or 50 feet or something like that, uh, you know, or maybe every 10 meters, they might have a line tied in or a knot tied in the line. And that way they can kind of feel those knots as they go in a no-vis situation, or they can visually see those knots or see the tags hanging off it or whatever it might be as an indicator of distance for them. But that's gonna be a lot more, again, technical diving, advanced diving, scientific diving, uh, outside of the normal recreational dives that most of us do. Tip number five is to stay observant and and aware of your surroundings. So I know this might sound funny and maybe a little bit of a cop out of a tip, but the amount of people that just kind of get in the water and kind of turn on autopilot in a way, you get into that Zen meditative mode that I've talked about in one of my other videos actually, you know, it's it's a really calming feeling, but it's really easy to just get locked into enjoying the dive and just kind of following the group that you don't really notice what's around you. And then if you do get separated because maybe you have a camera and you know, suddenly you see a sea turtle over here and you decide to swim over there, you get separated from your buddy or separated from the group. And you know, after you're done taking your picture or your video, you look back and they're gone. 
Well, you're gonna really wish that you were paying better attention to natural references or the dive guide before the dive brief happened and kind of told you, hey, look for this, look for that, or this degrees is the way back to shore. And you know, it's really gonna help you from getting separated from everybody like that. You really wanna be mindful of the surroundings around you as you, you know, are going on your dive, whether that's the depth that you're at, uh, you know, how long you've been on the dive. Of course, you need to be checking your pressure gauge too, because you need to know how much air is in your cylinder still. Uh, but even like the bottom behavior too. You know, if you're along a wall, that's one thing, but let's say you're on a sandy bottom and then it turns into a coral reef for a while and then it's a sandy bottom again and then it turns into a lot of seagrass and, you know, maybe a bunch of uh, coral again, you know, some, uh, maybe some dead coral or something like very identifiable, like, oh, hey, this is whole area of dead coral. There's brand new coral here. There's a sandy patch in between. Those natural references are really what's gonna keep you, you know, in the right direction and kind of help you out when you get a little bit lost or confused on which direction to head. And, you know, without paying attention to your surroundings and really being observant, you might miss those references like that. Navigation is one of those critical skills that you should just constantly be working on and practicing. And, you know, I definitely encourage you, grab a dive buddy, go out to a local dive site, or, you know, even on a charter next time, just try to do your best to really focus on the dive and, you know, check out everything around you, of course, pay attention to the fish and stuff too, enjoy the dive. But, you know, try focusing just on navigation some with your compass going to some known locations with your dive buddy and then navigating back or maybe try using natural navigation as well. Uh, definitely do this in a safe area with a dive buddy and a dive site that you've known already so you aren't gonna get completely lost. You know, don't do this in a, in a river with a current or something, maybe a nice calm lake or you know, a calm inlet body of water that you know very well that you aren't gonna be uh, lost or stranded with your buddy out in the ocean or anything. But you know, try this out, definitely improve on it over and over again. And then more importantly, take an underwater navigation course and you know, maybe even consider a search and recovery course or the rescue diver courses. Those are all courses that are going to advance your underwater navigation skill. And if you get a good instructor, they'll, you know, really put it into you and get you some practice in and give you the tools that you need to practice on your own afterwards. So you can go in and do different search patterns. You can do different grids and, you know, squares and triangles and circles and things like that to, you know, go in and practice your navigation skills underwater. Not being able to get back to your entry point, be it the boat that you started at or the shore that you stepped in from, is one of those fatal mistakes that divers make where, you know, like I said at the beginning of the video, instead of going to the shore, what if you made the mistake and you decided to go further out and now you're in the middle of the ocean somewhere so far away from shore that you don't have enough gas to get back and you have to try surface swimming with currents and waves and things like that. It's not a thing that you want to do and it's definitely a fatal mistake that some divers will make. And to learn even more fatal mistakes, click or tap the screen now so you can watch a video all about those. Thanks for watching everyone. With that, stay safe, have fun, and let's go diving.